everybody. Welcome to Before College TV Live. I'm Harlan Cohen. Today we have another college conversation, this time with four amazing, incredible, dynamic, charismatic graduates of White Swan High School. They're all together here. It's been many years, right, Brianna? Like how many years has it been since you've all been together like this? Like um, three, four it's been a while, right? And and yeah. you've known these people for a long time, right? Like you know, you've known Christopher for mm-hmm. how how many years? Um, since elementary. Since elementary, since he was mm-hmm. just a little boy. You remember like him in second grade? You do? Yeah. What was Christopher like in second grade, Alondra? <laughs> I don't know if he I want to say he would have like probably the same haircut, but I feel like we all look the same, but we it's uh it's very interesting because i mean me and brianna we used to we had this playground in the back and there was these trees and we would go back there and just talk hang out eat some munchies it's uh we all really grew up with each other like since kinder and so it was a very nice experience like seeing each other grow up and graduate and now flourish into our own lives yeah but yeah we got to see each other for a while that's wild. So you know, like, about Cage's, like, you know the things that Cage did that no one else knows. Right, yeah. Alondra? Do you know Cage's secrets? I know some secrets. <laughs> what are some secrets? What are some of Cage's secrets that we, we don't have to do that? Oh, I'm not gonna... just... <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't do that. But that's exciting. You, you've all known each other for a while, and now you're you're all in different places, and your lives have gone different directions, which is really exciting. And I want to learn more about you because whoever's watching this, uh, you know, wherever you want to go, you can get there. And the beauty is, we have people who are living these experiences who are just several years in the future, right? Like Brianna. Is it weird to think that you are four years, like four years out of high school? Yeah, for sure. (laughs) And I mean, do you feel old or older or do you still, or do you feel young? Um, yeah, I feel old. Do you? Cause you're so not, but I mean, compared, compared to me. Right. But like compared to someone who's in high school, who's like a freshman in high school, those eight years are are a long, that's a long yeah. time. Um, yeah. and, and a lot happens. So Alondra, do me a favor and take me to your, take me to your days at White Swan. I want people to understand who you are, like kind of describe yourself. Um, like if you were to paint a profile of, of you, were you active? Were you involved? Were you the center of attention? Were you kind of someone who was hanging in the background, not making a lot of noise? Were you really popular? Were you an athlete? Were you totally involved? Like, how did you spend your time? Who were you so that people can identify with you? I was kind of uh, pretty active in school. I remember being a lean crew leader, honorable, uh, honorables, um, the honorables team, honor society. I was junior class president. I was FFA president. So I feel like I was pretty active throughout high school. I did some sports. So I feel like that's what kind of got me close with my peers and classmates. I loved helping people as much as I could, like even my classmates. And through Lean Crew, I was able to do that. So Lean Crew, I was it was junior, senior year, and I got to help freshmen and sophomores. And I kind of got to like just share my experience, you know. So now I'm kind of showing it to them. And so I I really love that. And FFA is probably one of the things I miss the most about high school. Being president and having like my organization, planning events, having my members come to me and not just look at me as an officer, you know, about my program, but also just talking to me like as a friend. Being in that position really got me really closer to a lot of my a lot of my peers. So in high school, I could just remember just going from group to group, just talking to a lot of peers and a lot of my high school teachers. I feel like I spent a lot of my times with a lot of my high school teachers. Mr. Emsminger was a, uh, one of the biggest influence in why I wanted to do business and why I kind of chose to go to Heritage too. Mr. Clinton, uh, Brad Urquhart. Um, I got to spend a lot of time with them just talking and like I feel like they really helped my growth 
And so having them help me personally, help me kind of like then help my my classmates. Like, even though I we were the same age, same grade and everything, I always felt myself giving more advice, you know? And so like from errors that I made or things that, just conversations that you even have one-on-one with teachers, you know, you yeah. could share those experience with the rest of your your classmates. So I feel like in high school, I was just about, you know, here and there trying to be as more active as I could. Yeah. It sounds like you were really active and really involved and continued to be. And I know that you had a lot of academic success. So like, you know, you, you were a high achiever. Were you like stressed out type A? Um, what was it? Repeat the question for me. I'm sorry. Were you like stressed out, kind of like a stressed out, like type A personality, oh. like always, you know, trying to achieve and always trying to be successful and worried about, you know, not, not getting that thing done or that thing done? Were you, was that just kind of always, were you like that or you relaxed doing all of these things? No, absolutely. I feel like, um, so, um, I was, I'm a DACA student, so I was first generation so I feel like I had that pressure because I was first generation. So I feel my parents kind of not always, they did kind of put pressure on me, you know, like we brought, we came here for a better future. So as everything that I did, you know, the clubs that I joined, everything that I wanted to excel in, like I had them in the back of my head, you know, am I making my parents proud? So I feel like it was extra stress with me, but it kept me motivated. You know, I feel like that definitely got me going through this. So I was a very, uh, I was, I was stressed, you know, (laughs) and Spanish was never, or English wasn't my first language. It was Spanish. So I, um, there was also conflicts with that, like uh, my speaking uh, it was always, it wasn't always the best. I had an incident in FFA and, uh, uh, we were, we were in an event and I told my high school teacher, Oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go brooming. I'm going to go broom the off the, or the broom over there. And she's like, it's not brooming, it's sweeping. So I had the, my language barrier, um, kind of made it a little stressful. And so Mr. Clinton, just one of my professors for biology, I remember going in one day and just feeling so stressed out. And he gave me a dictionary and just said, keep it. He's a, uh, for you, mm-hmm. unfortunately, you got to make a little extra effort. You know, Eng- English wasn't your first language. You go home, you hear another language. So I would always get just confused sometimes. And um, he just told me to study it and it really did help, you know. So I always had that stress of like not understanding the whole context. And sometimes it was because of my language barrier because sometimes I didn't even understand the stuff that I was doing. And some of the homework that I had at home, like the homework that I did have, like I couldn't have my parents help me, you know, and I was the first one. So it's not like I had somebody to, oh, I'm going to go talk to my neighbor or have someone help me. Like my parents, as much as they wanted to, there was nothing much they were able to do. So I kind of like, there was times when I kind of felt hopeless, you know, like, I have so much work. I don't even know what to do. Like, and at the time where I live, I live on an orchard. There was no Wi-Fi. So we shared this little Wi-Fi or a little internet cube we used to get at the, our, uh, at our phone shop, uh, US Cellular. They used to carry this little internet and we would share it. But as soon as we used up all the gigabytes, uh, the internet would get slow again. So I didn't have the internet like resources to stay up and Google information and stuff like that. So it was, it was a little difficult. Um, and yeah. especially like my living situation too, at the time I didn't even have my own room. So it's not like, uh, once it was lights out, it was lights out, you know, and it wasn't like I was able to stay up and try to study a little extra harder, but I made, Sometimes I would even try to, when I would get home to the school early, sometimes 15 minutes, I would try to catch up on some homework if I wasn't able to finish it um, during last night at home or stuff like that. So uh, there was issues, but I feel like um, I was always, I wanted a better life than what I had at the moment, you know? And so I kept pushing for it and I knew that it was, 
academically, school was going to get me out of the situation that I was. So I just kind of like kept pushing forward, but it was stressful a lot of times. It really was, but I, I'm really glad I was able to manage it. Yeah. And then I want to know everyone's dream, but since I'm talking to you, will you just tell me, I mean, it's, it was, uh, oh, I lost you. It was fun. Oh, good. And now I have you again. Um, Alondra, what's your dream? Do you have a dream job, a dream, a dream profession? I don't know what I want to do yet. <laughs> I graduated high and I don't know what to do. Definitely something business wise, but um, I want to grow my skills. Definitely business administration in that area. Um, but I would like to have my own business eventually, but I would want to go back to school, maybe become a teacher later on and share all my experiences, you know, yeah. uh, coming, being first generation, overcoming my living situation, you know, things at home with, you know, your parents are all, not always great. Overcoming that, like, I would love to share my experience and let other students know, like, you know, it's possible. And it's all possible because of education, you know. I feel like I wouldn't have the opportunities if, that I have now um, if it wasn't because I continued my education. My goals, my wants, my needs, I'm not going to be able to get them with just like a paycheck from McDonald's. You know, I got to work at McDonald's. I got to see the experience and I, it's not it. So continuing my education, definitely. Um, the doors really do open for you. And so I want to eventually be able to go back to school and be become a teacher. But right now I'm choosing business administration because I want to open my experiences, learn as much as I can. So eventually when it comes time, when I become a teacher, I have, you know, experiences to show and what yeah. I learned. That sounds great. I mean, you're, you're in a great place. You're living life. And I think that the idea that you have to have this goal or this dream, like you don't need, you know, you don't need to have that. That's not something that that's not something that is required. So I think it's great that you've graduated from college and you're exploring and you'll see where it takes you next. So Brianna, I'm really curious to learn about you, high school Brianna. So if you could take us back and kind of give us a little flavor of, you know, where were you hanging out? What were you doing? Uh, you know, what was your personality like back then? Just kind of give us a little bit of insight back back. Back to the days of Brianna at White Swan. I don't know. I wouldn't say that I was um, the best student. Yeah. Yeah. So you weren't the best student. So you spent a lot of time as a cheerleader. And then did you have a lot of friends? Was high school a really good time of your life? Or was it kind of, you know, not the best time of your life? I feel like I was friends with everybody, but it was just high school to me. Yeah. I couldn't wait to get out. <laughs> I think, I mean, that, that's <laughs> right. The idea that you couldn't wait to get out of high school is good. You know, like, why couldn't you wait to get out? Well, why, why were you so eager to leave? I don't know. I was just so eager to grow up. And then now I have bills, <laughs> which is fun. <laughs> right. So, you, you know, do, do you wish you were back in high school or are you okay being? Uh, no, no. Yeah. Okay. You were very I'm quick good. to answer. Yeah. All right. All right. When I do these, it's interesting because you know, I don't meet a lot of people who are really honest about that. Like, like I just couldn't wait to get out of high school. You know, like it's graduation season when we're recording this. And I think some people are really excited. You know, I, I think there's yeah. something you said about that. But then it becomes what happens next. And we're going to talk about that because I'd love to hear what happened once you finally got out of high school. And then um, I want to make sure that I ask you this question and I'll ask it early or I could ask it later too. But right now, I'm kind of curious, Brianna, so in terms of, of where you are in your life right now, uh, do you have any dreams? Is there something that you really want to do or something that you're excited about? Right now, I'm just at Supercuts, but um, eventually I want to get into a full service salon. But I moved to a new city right before COVID hit. So it's been kind of hard, you know, getting to know people and getting my name out there. So kind of just sticking to where I'm at until things like slow down. Yeah. So where did you move to? Uh, Wenatchee. Okay. And is that mm -hmm. a bigger, is it, it's, is that a, a lot bigger? No, not really. Okay. And then, and then did you move there for work or was it just, and if I'm asking too many questions about your personal life, you certainly don't have to answer. No. Um, so my fiance is from here. So I moved over here 
and then um we just had a baby oh wow that's yeah. so exciting congratulations thank you yeah that's a, that's a big deal yes having a baby it's a lot of responsibility and it's a lot of fun yeah. and it's amazing. my second baby great so you know mm -hmm. you're a pro yes <laughs> right so you can you can share some some of those experiences um yeah i'd be interested to interested to learn about just what it's like to 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 be a, a young mom and mm -hmm. to work and to do all the things that you're doing because i imagine it's it's probably uh it takes a little while to get used to that is that true yeah. Yeah, you kind of learn as you go. I mean, there's no, um, I don't know. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to work through. Yeah, you, yeah. You just kind of learn as you go. There's like no book, you know. No, there's no class on graduating uh -huh. and being a mom and working and creating a life and finding balance and health. Like yeah, that's, yeah. that's the hardest part, I think. So I'm excited to learn more about you. Christopher, I'd love to learn about you and what it was like for you in high school. Who was high school Christopher? But high school me, I was very introverted, um, wasn't very communicative. I went through a lot of personal struggles in high school and it took a big hit on my education. I lost motivation. I was a D and F student. My, freshman and sophomore year. And then I finally got it together and I almost didn't graduate on time. I was waiting to like the last minute till four o'clock, a few days before graduation, before final grades, grades were put in and was told that I was able to walk. Yeah, because I had um, stability issues where I was moving from house to house with just me and my mom and then lack of money because she couldn't hold a job because it was just too overwhelming with all the hours that she was working and then always being away from home. Then she got sick and depressed. Mm. So I took care of her and had to like really step up for that. And then I lost a lot of family members every week and month. And that really took a hit on my mental health. So I was going through a lot of struggles. It took one teacher to really turn my life around. And that was my English teacher. It was two of them, Miss Trace and then Miss Lear. They were there for me in any way that they needed to be and helped me get back on track to graduate on time. And their door was always open. And Miss Trace was the one who pushed me out of my comfort zone to do yearbook and photography. And then that's still something I still do. Yeah, that's amazing. So uh, who's the teacher again who really, I know there were a couple, but but who... Really it was Miss Treese and Miss Lear. They were my two English teachers. Miss Treese and Miss Lear. Yes. Oh, I want to, because I want to. So Miss Treese mm -hmm. and Miss Lear, would you say they really saved you? I mean, I don't want to say like saved my life. It's kind of dramatic, but would you say they really? In a sense, I would say that they did, because I don't think I would have been on this path of going to college because. Honestly, with all the struggles that I faced, I honestly didn't see a hope for a future for me. I was just so stuck in my head that I didn't think I would make anything of myself. And then they helped me find this path. And that's why I decided to become a teacher because of the influence that they had on my life. So I hope to hopefully have the same influence when I become a teacher. That's, I mean, it's beautiful. So you were a D and F student. So for anyone mm -hmm. who is a D or F student who is really not having the easiest time, I mean, Christopher, you, you were in it and it was really dark, it sounds like. And how do you manage the darkness and how do you work through it so that you can turn this around? Because clearly, I mean, you are capable and really you know, smart and an exceptional student but during that time when you were a freshman and sophomore dealing with all of these other issues, you know, how do you get through that? How do you help someone to know that they can get through it? I had a really strong support system. Um, I was very introverted. So the people that I did talk to on a daily basis, I trusted them with just about everything and anything that I needed to, whether it was venting or 
emotionally breaking down, whatever the case may be. I knew I could rely on them anytime and anywhere I needed them. So I would say that probably having a good support system was the thing that probably got me through it all. I don't think I would have without it. And I know a lot of students don't, especially with the information that I'm learning. And then the conversation that I just took a part of, of how to be anti-racist with um, previous instructors that I had in I heard like a lot of stories similar to mine in education settings where they didn't feel like they would get to where they were. So yeah, it was just very reflective, especially looking back and taking part in this. Yeah. Well, I think that I'm fascinated with, with the student who's like the D or F because you were that student and you had, you had the teachers who approached you, it sounds like, and were like, Mm -hmm. Hey, Christopher, I see something you need to do this. And, and even if you didn't want to do it, they're like, you have to do this, you know, and they were really pushing you. So what about the kid who's a student, whether it's at white Swan or some other, some other school with a similar environment, and there isn't a teacher who reaches out to them and they don't feel like anyone's recognizing them and they feel invisible. Like, can they say something to a teacher, you know, how do they how do they do that if somebody isn't in their corner being so uh, engaging and so forceful? So I felt like I didn't have a person in my corner at first, and I had people reaching out to me. But in that sense, I reached out to social media first. Social media was my first outlet of just getting my voice out there. And I because at one point I felt like I was very pushed back and I didn't want to be seen, but social media gave me a platform to communicate with people online where I didn't need the face-to-face interaction, where I felt like they needed to know everything about me because, you know, social media is an outlet for communication, which I do still use, but I met an influencer, I guess I would say, and then my friends list just continued to grow on social media and then people were just messaging me on a daily basis so I would say maybe turn to social media strangers for me around the same age group that I was was a good outlet just to communicate and share bits and pieces rather than telling my whole story right rather than you know so I would say social media but I don't know what else to say okay I'm just trying to think of like social media. Sometimes there are like a lot of people who, who aren't always in the best place. There's also a lot of people who are in great places, but I'm just trying to think of that when it comes to social media, like would it be at what website, what type of social media, you know, where do you go where you're going to find kind people who aren't going to exploit you, who are going to encourage you and help you and connect you and, and encourage you. There's this one that I just learned about, but I don't remember the exact name of it because my teacher had us actually join it, had all of us join it. And it's a academically driven community. Yeah. So you go there to ask questions, no matter what the circumstances may be. But I don't remember the name of it. It's been a few weeks since we joined it. Yeah. <laughs> but I will definitely think about but even it. that idea of like, if you don't have teachers who you can reach out to, then through an online academic community. Uh, mm-hmm. of, of connecting um, and using, you know, social media in that, in that respect. Like I get that. Um, I think my dogs are going to bark for a second. Yeah. If, if it sounds loud, uh, hopefully it won't be too loud, but um, that's really interesting. And if you, you know, and as much as you want to share about, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of high school students who deal with really heavy, difficult stuff and they're going from one house to another, or, they are living with someone other than a parent or that person is no longer in their life who they lived with before. And they've been bouncing around when, when you're in such an unstable environment, how do you find stability? Well, stability for me. So even though I said it started with social media, but within the school setting, I actually had a school counselor reach out to me and they were like, I would say like a brick wall. He just sat there and he just listened to me. And I didn't expect to go in and tell my story like I did. I literally broke down that day and I met with him almost every week. And there was like no judgment, no opinions, no viewpoints on the things I was going through. He was just there to listen. So I would say that if students don't have like a primary connection or someone that they can communicate with, I would probably say reaching out to a school counselor who is meant 
who is there technically to help. And um, he was there to help. So I had a support system and he was like the foundation of that support system, I would say. So I know students, especially for me, don't like reaching out, don't like sharing, don't like communicating in class or, you know, even in their social circle. And I was one of those students. So I would say reaching out to a school counselor would be probably the first step. And maybe even starting to communicate with teachers one on one when they don't have a class full of students, because that's how communication for me started and how I was pushed out of my comfort zone. So if you don't want to talk in class, I would say maybe reach out maybe at the start of a class or maybe even at the end of a class and say, well, can we set up the time to meet just so I can talk to you about something? And then because that's what it was for me was communication in one on one settings that helped me get through that dark time. Yeah. So you were crying like you talked to this counselor when you say it was a brick wall. Did you mean like what did you mean by that? He introduced himself to me and he's like, I'm just here to listen. And he just sat there and he was attentive. He was listening and he gave suggestions on what I can do to deal with my emotions because I tend to bottle my emotions in high school and then they just bursted at any point. Like it was like a time bomb basically. And wow. it just went off whenever it reached its extreme. But he became that outlet to kind of diffuse my mindset and perspective on myself so I would say that because he was like a brick wall and he just sat there and listened it helped me release the emotions that I was penting up and helped me kind of deter my focus on not viewing myself as less yeah. than other students and started shifting my mindset on something that I can use to fuel motivation and that's what it was that's awesome and what's his name um i think his name was jeff yellow owl yeah and and he was really helpful it sounds like it yeah. sounds it sounds like it and that's you know i get so interested when i just when i hear about the struggles because i know there's so many people who go through that and just don't know how to they don't know how to work through it and and i think that's just so hard so um thanks for opening up and sharing that and I want to learn more about your journey from, from high school to college. And I also, I heard that you're like, you know, when, when you were at y, YVC, you know, a straight A student, right? Yeah, I was on the dean's list and president's list every quarter. That's crazy. Like, that's wild. You went from failing to being at the top of your class. And I know now you're at Central Washington and nothing's going to stop you, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Thanks. Thanks, man. Cage. Thanks for being so patient. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you? Good. Hey, what do you think of, of these stories? Um, I mean, it's kind of funny because I um, kind of already knew this about everybody. Chris yeah. is a little bit more. I didn't really necessarily know all that about Chris, but I mean, Brianna and Alondra's stories, I definitely... Uh, yeah, concordly with because I was there. So right, you've seen it, and now to see everybody a little bit in the future, I'm sure is a blast. So, Cage, take me back to high school, Cage, and just kind of tell me a little bit about you, and you know how you describe yourself, and and how other people could relate to you. I would say I was a very talkative person, a little bit too much sometimes, <laughs> but I was pretty involved. I, uh, I did sports. I was involved in football, basketball, and tennis, and then. I love sports, so that's usually what I was talking about. I guess I was just always trying to be the center of attention, which has completely changed now. It's not really my mindset, but I guess I was just the guy that was always trying to be noticed and try to make people laugh. And then when it came to college, and, and I know that you're now, a, you're now a senior at Washington State, and it's been, you know, a journey, I imagine, was it always something, was college something you were always interested in, in, in doing? Was that something that was going to be an automatic for you? Um, I mean, it's kind of funny because growing up, when I thought of college, all I thought of was like college football, college basketball. I never thought about the academic side of it. So it's like, all right, I'm going to go to school. And I'm at Washington State, but growing up, I wanted to go to University of Washington, which is, they're like arch rivals. <laughs> but yeah. um. I mean, I would say that I always knew that I was likely to go to college, but even if I didn't, I knew that I'd follow down some path that 
would be good for me. Not that like, I think college is a great thing to look forward to or something to strive towards, but there's also a lot of other paths that can be just as successful or even more. So there was never, I never necessarily felt forced or that college was the ultimate goal for me, but I knew that I would do something that I would enjoy and would be fulfilling. Yeah. And then what's your major in college now? I'm in uh, elementary education. So to be a teacher, what grade would you like to teach? I would like to do middle school, which seems like most people steer away from, but right. I'm, I'm willing to take the challenge. So you like to be with tortured souls dealing with the, the, <laughs> yeah. their, their first identity crisis. And you, you like that. What attracts you to middle school? It's kind of funny because I think that middle school was kind of the best time of my K through 12 experience. When you're in high school, I mean, kids are, they're turning into young adults and they have so many, not necessarily stresses, but it's uh, definitely going on to being adult. And and then you look at younger kids, their lives are stress-free, but middle school kids, I mean, they're just stepping right into that. It's like the foundation step of life is becoming a little more stressful, but it's also still hanging out with your friends and I don't know. Middle school just seems cool. So, yeah. You know, I think of middle school and you you all can, can let me know if you you think this or not, but I found, and I, and I did a lot of work around, around, uh, Washington and, and I don't know what would, you're not in the Valley though. Cause you're kind of like, you're kind of like off, right? Like where, well, how would you describe white Swan in terms of Um, work? We, so I guess technically we're in the lower Yakima Valley, but we're okay. really far west in, in it. So we're not necessarily in the agricultural central part of it. We're kind of an outlier. Yeah. You're kind of, you're, you're kind of isolated. Um, yeah. A, a, a little bit. And um, I don't know. I lost my train of thought. I was, th- I, I forgot exactly why I was, why that was important. I think I got embarrassed because I wasn't sure if it was in the Yakima Valley <laughs> or not. And I was like, all of a sudden lost my, I lost my train of thought, but, um, in terms of, so your, so your dream, your dream job is to be a middle school teacher, middle school math teacher. Is that right, Cage? I mean, yeah, you can, I mean, my dream job would be a professional golfer, but yeah, I'm going to school <laughs> to be a teacher. So. <laughs> right. Are you still but, golfing? Oh yeah. Are you golfing at central or are you golfing at Washington state? I'm sorry. No, it's just recreational. Yeah, it'd be great if you could, right? That would that would be oh, yeah. awesome. Yeah. So uh, that journey from high school to college to beyond, uh, I know that there's a lot of emphasis on on that being one of the paths, and I know that each of you have your own path. And I'd love to just learn a little bit more about how you were able to get to where you are and the choices that you made and why you made them. Uh, were you always interested in going to heritage? Did you always know you were going to go to college? Uh, what was that experience like for you? And, and, and also being a DACA student uh, in terms of financial aid and opportunities, you know, there are those opportunities, but it can be a little trickier, right? Yeah, absolutely. After high school, I definitely knew I wanted to continue my education. I actually wanted to go to the University of Washington when it was signing day and I actually got offered my scholarship that same day. I didn't want to sign the Heritage because I wanted to go to UW. Uh, UW. But the, one of the reasons why I didn't sign to UW and why Noemi didn't want to sign to UW was because it was expensive. And because I'm a DACA student, I wasn't offered loans. I would have to go privately through like a, a bank and ask for loans. I wasn't financially like through WASFA. I wasn't able to get um, money like that. So it was expensive to go to UW. So um, no, I mean, just said, just sign up for Heritage. And if Heritage comes or if the opportunity goes to UW comes, you could go if you find the money. And so the day of signing day came and I actually got offered the scholarship. I applied for two full scholar, uh, full right scholarships to Heritage. And I got an email that I didn't get any of them. I was kind of confused. And so for I got the SOAR scholarship. I was actually reserved, or I guess I was the second running up. So whoever, let's say someone denied their scholarship, I was going to be the next one. And so that's what happened the day of uh, the scholarship. They were going to email me, but Noemi ended up, they, they ended up reaching out to Noemi and just told them, like, 
we'll just do it that same day here. Having that scholarship get offered to me, it took a big weight off my shoulder because I'm a, like I said, I'm a DACA student. I was already kind of stressing of how or where I was going to go to get this money. Uh, my parents definitely uh, were not able to afford college. It's, it's ridiculous how much we had to pay because of my status. So I was thinking about, you know, if I wasn't going to go to Heritage, maybe start off at a community college. But the fact that I got offered the scholarship to go to Heritage, it was just so relieving. So I was able to continue my education, which was ho- what the whole plan was, because school for me, like I mentioned before, is really important. Yeah. So you got a scholarship. That's awesome. You got two scholarships, it sounds like, which is which is amazing. Was it two? No, just one. So I applied for two full ride ones, but I got none of them. I was so I ended up right. applied for the dreamers and the store and I got the store. Okay. And that took care of yeah. everything. That was like a full ride scholarship. That was a full ride scholarship. Awesome. Yeah, for then, up to five years and I only did four. That's great. And then when you were so you, when you were in high school and you were in gear up, right? Because that's so that's how you know Noemi. And just tell me who is Noemi so other people can understand. So I met Noemi when she came. I think she was Caesar's assistant. And I believe Caesar at the time was the gear up coordinator. So she was just kind of helping. I don't know if, uh, what it, technically her position was when she started in. But Caesar left. So she took um, Caesar's position as the uh, gear up coordinator. But she was mainly actually no Caesar was there when. She left after we left, or okay. Caesar left after we left. But she was helping mainly, no, um, Caesar with a bunch of gear up events and stuff like that. And uh, Caesar was actually getting more busy, so Noemi was the one that I was actually helping us the most when it came to college applications. Um, if we wanted to visit any campuses, stuff like that. Um, it was mainly her who we were going to, and she was actually finding a lot of. Uh, resources for us, uh, resumes, uh, a lot of, uh, just a lot of events like that. It was, uh, her who was helping us and I, she held a couple, I want to say a couple tours for universities. I didn't get a chance to go to them, but yeah, she was kind of taking over Caesar's role, which was a gear up coordinator. Right. So gear up really helped you when it came to the application process. When it oh, came to, oh. So, yeah, yeah we, that's, she was the biggest support. I'm, I think every, we had like five minute, five, 10 minute breaking pass. It was always straight to her office. Hey, I got this email or, Hey, I need help with this or just questions that we just had upcoming junior seniors about to leave. Uh, gear up was a big, big help. That's, that's great. Uh, Cause I don't think a lot of people know about gear up. And the value mm-hmm. and, and and how you've been helped. So you know, I'd love to learn more about that. Brianna, I'd love to learn about your path. So I know that you're in high school and you, you know, love being a cheerleader and you wanted to get out of high school. And uh, what was your path? So I know that you have a little bit of a different path and it's a path that a lot of people take. And I'd love to learn yeah. more about the choices you made. Yeah. So I actually took um, about a year off after high school because I did have a baby then. And then, so I was just working. And then after that, I decided that I wanted to go back to school to do hair. And then um, I applied to a financial aid and I got a grant. And then um, also a little bit of um, student loans. Nice. So yeah. you went to, you went to beauty school or to mm-hmm. Evergreen Beauty College, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and then the path was when you were in high school, did you were you planning on going to school, you know, right after high school or were you planning a different path? Yeah, so I originally wanted to attend um Paul Mitchell in um Richland, but then um after finding out that I was pregnant, plans kind of changed a little bit. So I just put a pause to that. And then um, the day after graduation, I started working. And um, then um, my mom actually helped me out with um, going back to school. So um, that was really 
awesome of her to do because she didn't have to do that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm curious about being in high school and finding out that you're pregnant. That was your senior year. Yeah. Tell me about that. And again, I want to respect your boundaries, but I know there's a lot of people that deal with that and that's got to be a really shocking day and a lot of, a lot of big yeah. feelings that go along with it. You know, how do you, how, yeah, how did, sure. how did you process all that? Oh gosh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I was terrified. I think it was like three months before graduation that I found out and I don't know. I just, I thought my life was over and I didn't think that I was um, ever going to be where I'm at today. Cause I always knew that this is what I wanted to do. I just, I didn't think that I would be able to get here to where I'm at today. So when you found out that you were pregnant, did you talk to your mom? Is your, is your mom in your, it sounds like your mom's an important person in your life. Yeah. Not at first. I kind of kept it a secret from everybody because I, I wasn't sure like, you know, what was next. And I was um, in a little bit of denial about it. I think honestly, the first person that I told was uh, my sister. And then that same week I was supposed to be applying to um, school and um, Caesar called me into his office um, to do that. I was a little bit like mad at myself and like mad at the world. It's such a lonely feeling I can imagine and such a scary feeling. And there are so many different emotions that would go through someone's mind, but you're here today, you know, with a beautiful, what's your, what was your first baby, a, a boy or a girl? girl. Mm-hmm. A girl. Right. So you have a beautiful girl and you're at a place where you're working and, and you're continuing on your, your path towards your dreams. Mm-hmm. Uh, I only ask because I know there's other people who are going to go through it. And yeah. when they do that feeling of being so alone and that feeling of being so afraid you know, how are you able to take that feeling and then be able to get the help to open up, to start to take a step forward so it is okay? Gosh, I don't know. Like in that in that moment, you think that it's the end of the world and um, you kind of just have to take it day by day and um, things start falling into place. This is stuff they don't talk about in high school. Like, you know, the, the real life stuff that I... Th- I think takes up most of our time and energy, you know, and just that message of knowing that you're not alone, that there's someone there. And like, if, if anybody was dealing with this, and I know that you're not, you're not a counselor or a therapist, but if someone was dealing with this and wanted to reach out and was like, Hey, Brianna, what do I do? You know, do you, you know, do you think you could point them in the right direction or at least, you know, help, help them to know the next thing to do? Yeah. I, in a sense, I mean, um, I think that deep down, um, for yourself, you really know, um, what is right. And, um, like I knew from the beginning, like the second that I found out, I knew that I, um, I wanted to keep, uh, my daughter, but, um, yeah, I don't know. You just, uh-huh. You do. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to jump in. You, you're very thoughtful. And again, you know, I see Alondra and yeah, Alondra, you're so, you have some most supportive eyes and, you know, I almost feel like you want to reach out and grab Rihanna, and, like hold her hand. <laughs> right. I yeah. Um, I think you're really strong, Rihanna, to be honest. I didn't Thank even, you. we didn't even, nobody was, no one knew she was pregnant, you know, until after high school. So, you know, I could only just imagine how you felt, you know, graduation and it's kind of like everyone coming to you like what are you doing after like you know you everybody has a plan for you and so uh-huh. sometimes when it doesn't go that way it's like that and so I could just imagine how you felt like keeping all those emotions and something so big you know pregnancy is something so beautiful and I'm so happy you get to experience motherhood so Thank you know you. I'm really happy for you but you know it is hard and I could just imagine how you felt Three years ago, four years ago, biggest decision yeah. of our time, you know, graduation and then getting hit with something else bigger, you know, motherhood. So, yeah, you know, props to you because I bet you, you, you were going through a lot. Now you look amazing though. So I'm really happy you. with your everything that you decided with. Yeah. Is that one of your kids? 
Can you? Yeah. Can you hear yeah. her? Yeah, it's great. Yeah. It's almost like on cue. It's like you. It's almost like you planned it, Brianna. I don't know. <laughs> now is the time to, to make some noise. Um, and, and then you need to tend to that. But I wanted to also ask you about beauty school because I'm really curious about yeah. that. For anybody who wants to who wants to choose to go down that path of beauty school, would you recommend it? Um, you know, what should they think about? Yeah. Just help us to understand that path. Is it too? And if you need to, are you able to? Yeah. Let me just tell her. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. So, um, so the beauty school path, tell me a little bit about that, Brianna. Yeah. So, um, it was a, um, 10 month program. Um, if you go full time, so it's 1600 hours and, um, they, uh, the school I went to was a really good school. So um, day one, we were already um, hands-on cutting hair, and I really learned a lot. But um, I think that the the most um, learning that I did is um, outside of school, like in the real world. And then, oh, bless you. Bless you. <laughs> and then um, I also did like um, a, like an internship. Um, during my program, um, they offer that, um, to get your hours done faster. And, um, I learned a lot. I learned a lot through that because, um, I was able to, um, work with another stylist hands-on and she really taught me, um, a lot of the things that I know today. Is it super expensive to, to go to, um, beauty college? Kind of. Um, I think. I believe that the program was um, a little under twenty thousand. Oh wow! But um, yeah, but um, my financial aid covered part of it, and then um, I also got a loan, right? Which which wasn't too bad. Great. Okay, so then you do that for ten months, and then you get your, mm -hmm. your you graduate or get yep. your certification. Uh -huh. Yeah. So they they do a um, graduate. Mm -hmm. So they do a graduation ceremony. Um, in Linwood because it's um, the school originated um, in uh, Western Washington. Right. But um, so we would do our ceremony over there and they, they help with everything. Like, um, you know, they have counselors that help you stay on track and seriously, it's like a, like a little family, like a little community for it. It's awesome. Oh, that's great. I don't think a lot of people know, know about that. Right. Oh, I'm uh -huh. sick of yeah. That. You, yeah. Um, I think that yeah, in beauty school, you will build like, um, lifetime friendships with, you know, those people and it's great. Yeah. That sounds wonderful. Well, cool. Well, thanks Brianna. Uh, I'm going to visit with, with Christopher and Cage for a little bit, but thank you so much. And, yeah. and what's your daughter's name? Savannah. Savannah, mm -hmm. nice to meet you, Savannah. Hi, I hope you're having the best okay. night. It's nice to meet your mommy. <laughs> thanks, thanks for hanging out. Um, cool. And all right, so I want to talk to these guys, and then I think for the other ones, I I love seeing Savannah. It's wonderful. When we edit it, it might be a little hard because all of a sudden, sometimes we move stuff around. So um, you know, it, just for the if if Savannah can hang out for a little bit, but maybe when we get into a couple of the other things, yeah. maybe it could just be you if that's if that's possible. Yeah, I'll go. I'm gonna but, take her downstairs. Savannah is like Savannah, you look like <laughs> so smart and so much fun, and you're so interesting and you have so much to say, and I'm so excited that I get the chance to meet you. So thank you. <laughs> Good to meet you. Cool. Awesome. That's a treat. All right, thanks, Savannah. Um, <laughs> um, all right, cool. So, um, all right, I want to talk to I want to talk to uh, to Cage and Christopher for a sec. I'm gonna I'm gonna mute. Great. Okay. So, uh, where was I? Got sidetracked a little bit. So, okay, uh, Christopher. So, I know that you graduated. Eventually, you're muted. By the way, okay, Christopher, you graduate from uh, you barely graduate from White Swan High School, and then you make your next move and where did you go? And just tell me a little bit about that process because now you are at, now you're at, at central, right? Yes. Yeah. So I want to know how you got there and want to understand how you go from a student who could barely, who barely graduated 
to really thriving? Okay, so the path that I'm on of being a teacher wasn't originally my first path. So I was going to go to an art institute in either Seattle, New York, or California. And I got accepted to all three of those places because of the work that I submitted, you know, like my portfolio that I had. And then I also had a connection in Kansas when I moved down there who with an art teacher. And I was on honor roll down there in middle school. And I was reaching out to her to see if that path was still available. And because she remembered who I was and all the work that I've done, that path was still available too. So I was more creative. That's my original path. But financially, that path wasn't really an option for me. It just didn't fit with the hand that I had at the time. So Noemi worked with me to the very last minute when you know, classes were rolling around and she helped me apply to YBC. And, you know, obviously I got accepted. And I think the prime motivation on how I made that change was because normally when students work hard day in and day out in high school to, you know, get to college or whatever their path may be, it does get tiring when college does happen. And I've seen that happened to a few students and friends that I've had, and they just ended up leaving college. So I think because I had those struggles and because I wasn't academically succeeding in high school, I was ready to just hit the floor running when I got to YBC. It was just like a fresh start, basically, when I got to YBC. It was a whole new community, a bunch of new students that I never interacted with. And yeah. And it presented a lot of new opportunities. So the first thing that I did was I established connections with the professors that I had at YBC. And I had that one-on-one communication. Because I was so introverted, that was the advice I kept hearing from the teachers at White Swan. Like, don't be afraid to go into office hours and go talk to your teachers when you need to or when you have questions on projects and stuff. On the first day of school and every day when I needed it, I would stay on campus and go to instructors office hours and ask them any questions that I had, especially when email was the direct contact, it's not always available right away. So I would take advantage of that. So that's kind of what helped turn it around because I was so introverted and I didn't like asking questions. My way was the right way and no other way was. (laughs) So that's why when I was failing, that kind of helped flip it around. You know, I just wasn't afraid to reach out to people that I was in classes with at YBC and that kind of built a community to you know interact with people that I haven't interacted with before and that kind of just segued it to you know reaching out to counselors there too as well you know in the counseling center to possibly transfer and then I got involved in the transfer club to notice what equivalency I needed for all my credits to transfer to Central because there's some courses that don't. So when I did graduate from YBC, all 90 credits that I taken did transfer over. So I had no issue with that. That's awesome. It sounds like paying for this was not an easy thing for you. You know, you, you didn't have a lot of you didn't have a lot of resources. So, no, I so how are you able to pay for YBC and how are you able to pay for Central? Well, one good thing that I would say is that for students who may be listening to this down the, down the road is that your economic situation or your financial situation isn't going to define you. There's a lot of resources out there, especially for scholarships and Because there are all those resources out there and because my mom didn't have the best financial background, I was able to receive full financial aid. And I didn't think that that was going to be a thing. And then it was. And then on top of my scholarship, I was just so financially secure, which was a new feeling for me that my education wasn't another burden that I needed to worry about. So it was interesting, but the scholarship that I did apply for was a tribal scholarship. So because it was tribally endorsed, I got accepted for the full amount, which did make living easier and it helped really turn my life around for the better. Yeah. And just, so just to be really clear, if you're someone who comes from a home where you don't have 
you, you don't have the finances to go to college, you can go and you can be yeah. financially secure. And I think people don't get that, right? Like Christopher, yeah. people struggle with that. Yeah, financial aid is a really good window. And I used it and I was able to take, not take advantage of it, but I was able to have that as my foundation for, you know, pursuing higher education. And I was able to receive the full amount because my mom wasn't financially secure. And, you know, looking back and still being on the reservation, to go back to your question, um, White Swan from my time here and then when I was in Kansas, it didn't change. It still stays the same. It hasn't changed from when I was young to now. And one thing that my mom always told me was that go out, go pursue higher education and do whatever you want to do because there are resources available. And one thing that kept me motivated to apply was that it's okay to hear no because there's more than one opportunity. And when you hear no, especially when you're trying to go to college or you're trying to find your path, you think no, that one no is going to stop you from moving forward. And, you know, I heard no a lot from when I was doing the the thing with Alondra, because I also applied for one of those things too. And when it was um, like the observation part of that scholarship, I was, you know, dropped from that. So I wouldn't say to let those situations or your conditions define what you can and can't do, because there are a lot of opportunities out there. You just have to know where to look for them. And that's kind of what I did. Yeah. And then when you're at YVC, it was your professors, like were there clubs and organizations? Did you get involved with, I know you mentioned the transfer organization. Were there others? Yeah, I was. So I did ASL my first quarters, my first two quarters there. So I was going to Deaf Coffee a lot and that brought a lot of interest into wanting What's ASL? to American Sign Language. Right. So I did. So I learned sign language and, you know, I went to Deaf Coffee and it was just a new community to be a part of with not only other ASL learning students, but, you know, the community as in the Yakima community for high school students who were in Running Start. So I, w- I wouldn't, s- I'm so probably how I'm trying to say this is that don't be afraid to, you know, step out of your comfort zone in places that you're not technically familiar with or people you may not know, because that's what I did. And Transfer Club that I was a part of was like kind of the foundation for that, because I was able to meet with a lot of instructors because I did a lot of fundraising for the Transfer Club mm-hmm. to technically do the same thing as Gear Up, where we, you know, fundraise to go to colleges to figure out where we wanted to transfer to. So I kind of just transitioned and did the same thing, but actually fundraised. So I don't know. It's just kind of weird. <laughs> no, it's great. It's just, it's just great. Cause it's just, again, that path of, of mm-hmm. wherever you are, if you're in middle school, if you're in middle school and you're in a horrible situation, you know, it's like, and you feel like there's just no way out. It's like, okay, here's Christopher, right? Like your freshman and sophomore year were catastrophic, it sounds like. Yeah. As bad as it could have been. And then you found a way to get where you are. And once you do that, it's like you realize there's no limit, right? It's like (laughs) kind of like it's almost an addiction in some sense of like an addiction and like that anything's possible, like addicted to the possibility of, of just like my world can look so different. You know what I mean? Like once you break, yeah. once, once you break through impossible, anything's possible. You know? Yeah. Cause that's where I was stuck for the longest time was thinking that everything was impossible and I couldn't find a path that was right for me. And, you know, because I was so creatively driven, I was so geared towards the arts, but then because of everything that I've been through and the people that motivated me to continue learning I decided to switch my path and then go to YVC and, you know, become a teacher. So the advice that I would probably have just to, you know, correlate with all of this is that one path isn't just meant for you. Cause I thought I was only meant for one path. Like I could only pursue that one path. And then 
because of financial situations, you know, I found another path. So I, you know, like you said, that that anything is possible once you get past that part. And I don't know, there's just so many ways to put this that I can't really put it into words because, you know, it's just. (laughs) You've done such, you've done such a great job. And I just want to ask you one more question and it's, it's a personal question. Um, I mean, these are all personal questions, but, but you, you, you talked about dealing with a lot of loss of loved ones. And I, I don't want to get, I don't want to get too deep into that, but what's your suggestion for somebody who, who is dealing with this like you did and how do you work through it in a healthy way? Because of the stereotype of, you know, boys who are, can't cry, that was a thing that, you know, really allowed me to break through my hurdle that I had in front of me that I couldn't break because I'm a boy and you know because there's the stereotype that boys need to be strong once I got past that and realized that emotions are feelings that we need to process to get better and you know see the other side so I would say don't be afraid to break when you need to because it's not going to do any good to hold it in. That was a big hurdle for me is that I held it in. You know, I didn't like communicating even with my mom or my family because, you know, she had her breaking points because of all the people that we lost and she had to help our family through that process because we used to have like family gatherings or we would go meet in Toledo is where, or the Kinswell Park, which is named after our family. We would go there and have reunions every single year, but because we lost those elders who technically were the glue, we all kind of drifted apart. It was just a lot to go through. And yeah. I don't know, there's just so many ways to process it and word this that I don't, I can't exactly word it. I mean, you're, you're from a community where I don't know if therapy and emotions and, and sharing those things are, are what people do every day. Um, yeah. And, you know, you, breaking through that, it really changed your life. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, cage again, you're so, you're so I, thanks Christopher. I really, I really appreciate it. It's, it's, it's great stuff. Um, gosh, I could talk to you all forever. I'm, I'm interested that, you know, Christopher, I have one more question being native. So are you, are you native? Yes. Okay. So as a native student, um, you know, how has that helped you and how has that challenged you? So I would say that it helped me a lot in challenging the stereotype that comes with being Native American in college. I know that it comes from every racial background, that there's the stereotypes. But when I went to, you know, YBC in Central, I finally got like the technically first experience of learning about my identity. So I would say that it kind of transitioned me into kind of the mindset that I have about it, because one assignment that I don't know if they'll probably remember would be for Mr. Shepard. And it was a letter to the Washington Redskins that we wrote for his class. And, you know, seeing that come into fruition was definitely a new thing because they recently changed their name. And that was like something that we did in high school. And I don't know. So kind of how I would put it is value who you are is something that really shifted my mindset on myself to kind of keep pushing forward because sometimes people think that their identity is what holds them back. And there's resources out there for who you are. And because of that tribal scholarship, I got endorsed kind of $6,000 every single year for college. And that was like my foundation of going into, you know, YBC and then transitioning to Central to be a teacher. And because of that foundation that I had financially, it was really able to put that step forward for me to, you know, kind of keep moving forward. I don't know that, I don't know. Yeah, that's great. You're, you're, it's, it's, it's really helpful. And I think that, that uh, I think you've done a wonderful job sharing that. And I really, I appreciate it all. So, so thank you. Uh, Cage. So I'm, I want to understand you were at White Swan and then you, you went pretty far away from home. Um, you know, going from White Swan to Pullman is, is a bit of a trip. And I know that it's hard for some people to, to leave home. You know, White Swan's a really tight community. And I want to understand, 
you know, how did you make that transition to college and was it an easy transition for you? Well, uh, initially, I didn't actually go to Washington State. I initially went to Eastern Washington University, which is really close to Spokane. I think it's only, it's probably 45 minutes away from where Washington State's at. It's not far at all. But I went there initially, and I definitely struggled. I wasn't the most mature. I don't think I was ready to leave home yet. Um, it had nothing to do with the school. The school is great made some great friends, great people there. I just wasn't the most mature person. So what I, does that mean? Explain that. I think me. I did like what made you what made it hard? What what where did you struggle in terms of your maturity and your choices and and, and you know options and how you um, realize it? I mean it's difficult now looking back because honestly it really wasn't that bad. I'm not sure what I was um where I struggled at because I, I had friends, I did a lot of things, I was involved. So I'm not necessarily sure why I felt I was struggling, but for some reason, I guess I, there was something that I didn't feel was right or I wasn't fulfilling something. So I ended up transferring to Yakima Valley College, which is YBC, where I actually stumbled upon Chris a couple of times. I remember seeing him, but, um, I initially went to Eastern, then I transferred there. I did two years there, and then then I transferred to Washington State. And I transferred, I guess the reason I initially went to Eastern and then the reason I chose Washington State later on, I just wanted to get away from home. Um, you're only in college for a very brief part of your life. And I not that I wanted to be far away from my family, but I just wanted to gain an experience somewhere else and get away for a bit and it's yeah. uh been great so yeah well it's it's interesting that that i want to go back to i know it's several years ago graduating and then going to eastern washington when you when you mm -hmm. when you made that change and transition did you think it was going to be you know easy did you did you have any any expectations um, were you nervous about that? Um, I would say I was definitely really nervous. I My mindset's a lot different now than it was then. I was very uh, concerned of what people thought of me and how I carry myself, which now I'm a lot more self-accepting. And I don't really, not that I don't care about other people's opinions, but I just kind of do my own thing. But I was definitely nervous going into it. And I guess I had this... Uh, predetermined idea in my head that Eastern would be the greatest time of my life. My parents met there. So that's the biggest reason why I went. I was like, okay, if my parents went there at the time of their lives and so will I. And it wasn't bad. I mean, as I stated earlier, I just, for some reason, I guess there was something I was missing or, and I'm not really sure what that was. I just think I was a little immature at the time. How long did you stay? I believe I was there for, I was either there for a quarter or two. I wasn't there for the full year. I came back to, I started YVC in the spring following high school graduation. So I was there for, I believe, two quarters off the top of my head. I'm not exactly sure. Was it hard to decide to come back home and go to YVC? Um, yes and no. I think the tough part was more of just, I... And I, I'm embarrassed to say this, but growing up, I had this notion in my head that if you went to community college that, oh, you you, uh, you weren't as good as other people. You, you settled for a school that you couldn't get into other schools and you went there. Or it was for people that went back to school later in life. But then, and I had a tough time kind of dealing with that. But then I actually get there. And I'm like, man, this is no different than any other school. I could get an Ivy League education here if I put my mind to it. So. Right. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I mean, it really opened my eyes to, don't get me wrong. I think every school is great, but I think school is what you make of it. And I had, I personally feel I was more challenged at YBC than I have been at any other school. So. Right. And then when you are doing really well at a community college, you can transfer to incredible right. schools. Like you can really, you, you could, you know, right. If, if you work hard, you could transfer anywhere. Like, yeah, I, 
I, the world was mine. I mean, just like Chris, I was on the Dean's list and president's list every quarter and I didn't necessarily try the best or my best when I was in high school and my grades were reflective of that. But so I went from in high school, not being able to choose very many colleges to after community college, I probably could have went to any school in the state if I had wanted to. That's amazing that mm-hmm. you, so you weren't that great of a student in high school. I, I just didn't apply myself. If I applied myself, I would have walked out of there with a 4.0, but I didn't try. <laughs> right. And, and, and why didn't you? I was just lazy. I didn't have the right mindset. I, I just did what I needed to do to get by. And I just didn't push myself to be the best that I could. Yeah. I like, I like that idea that you're all doing so well. And that you could be so smart and so capable, but your grades don't reflect that. You know, and Mm -hmm. I think that's really important for students who aren't, you know, they aren't making honor roll or they're just getting by or they've got family issues that are really causing a lot of other distractions. It's, it's, It's really hard to do well in class when you're worried about everyday life, right? Chris, I would imagine, you know, it's, 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 it's not, it's not the first thing that you do. Um, Your grades aren't the most important, but uh, Cage, so when you were at YVC and made, you said Dean's list and honor roll or presidents, what'd you say? It was a. It's a, I believe Dean's and presidents. It's a little different than WSU, but I'll just, just say honor roll to make it simple. So, so when you were at YVC and then you made honor roll and, and you then decided to transfer, how did you choose, how did you choose to go to Washington state? So I had the intention of being a teacher when I was at YVC. So I narrowed down my results to where I wanted to go and I narrowed it down to central Washington in Washington State. I didn't want to go to the west side of the state. University of Washington, great school, but I'm not the biggest city guy. I wasn't trying to live in Seattle. And there's other schools, but I just never really considered them. Central Washington's in Ellensburg, which is the windiest city in the world. So I crossed that off. And I was like, <laughs> hey, I'm going to I'm going to Washington State. So that's where I ended up. Because <laughs> the wind, really? Yeah, the wind really drew me away. <laughs> that's funny. Like you're serious. It's the win. I'm 100% serious. That's the biggest factor of me going to, hey, I'm going to Washington State. Is I didn't want to go to Central because of the win. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that's, oh, that's so fascinating. I, didn't, I had no idea. So, so at, uh, at Washington State, it, there's less wind? I mean, don't get me wrong. We still get our fair amount of wind. But <laughs> growing up, we played a lot of sports in the Ellensburg area. And I just, there was not a single day I can remember being there where it's not wind gust and i i do not like the wind <laughs> you really so. don't oh that's so funny no <laughs> so, so i love that so when you then transferred to to you call it wazoo is that what you guys say right like yeah, wazoo wsu right yeah. i like to be you know i like to be in in you know like i'm one of you you know <laughs> it's like wazoo when you transferred to to washington state were you able to find your connection and community like what did you do to help yourself to really create a comfortable environment. Well, the nice thing about when I initially had transferred as a junior and going into my specific per, or, um, major, we had a group of people that we basically had every single class with, which made it really convenient to meet people. And outside of that, I'm, I'm a big sports guy. I would just go to the gym and play basketball and just spark up conversations with people. I mean, I'm a really outgoing guy now and, I've never actually joined any clubs or really participated in things there. I just kind of go out of my way to talk to people. And that's how I've made all my friends there is literally just speaking to someone in class or at the gym. I mean, my closest friend there, we were just outside of a class and I just complimented something he was wearing. And the next thing you know, we're hanging out and now we are roommates. And the way I see it is if you don't spark a conversation with somebody, you never have the opportunity to meet them. And if they don't want to talk to you, I'm sure if you talk to a hundred people, one of them is going to talk to you. Well, I can imagine someone hearing that and thinking, okay, well, you know, that's really embarrassing. You know, I don't like getting rejected. It's uncomfortable when people don't respond the way I want, or they think I'm weird or you you miss every shot you can take. So (laughs) where you can tolerate rejection. I can now. I couldn't two years ago, but I can now. (laughs) What's the difference? Self-acceptance, understanding who you are 
just rolling with it, honestly. And how did you get to that point? A lot of reading, a lot of, uh, makes me really, now I guess I'm really diving into what I do in my off time, but when I'm not golfing or doing some sort of sport related thing or work, I like to read psychology books and stuff that really talks about not necessarily human mind, but just mental awareness. And I like to just take bits and pieces of that. And I really not necessarily found who I was, but I just learned about the human condition and how to accept who you are and face rejection and just live your life and not, uh, not let anything hold you back. Well, now the next question is what are a couple of those books? Cause I know there's a lot of people who would like to be where you are because it seems like <laughs> um, a really good place. My favorite is mindless golf by Dr. Gio Valiente. It's a golf book, but there's also a lot of, um, tips and I guess lessons that you can take and throw into life, not just golf. I think that's what I like about golf so much is there are so many things that you can take from golf and throw into your actual day-to-day -day life. I feel like it's a very similar thing, but so mindless golf. So mindless golf. I, so I guess Freud was Sigmund Freud. I guess he was more of a neurologist, but I like to, some of the stuff that he talked about in his writings. And then uh, it's kind of funny because Booker T. Washington was not a psychologist or anything, but reading some of his stuff about slavery back in the day and the ability to overcome and not what you've collected or what you've done in your life, but how you've overcome things and what you do after that. I really took away from, or took a lot away from his readings and some of the sayings that he had back in the day. Yeah. That's great. I mean, you're, you're in a great place and that piece of just like, you know, how do we get there? You know, like your path was, it just took some time. Um, it just took, right. it just took some time to get there. And that idea of transferring, it's okay to transfer, right? Oh yeah. I initially, I didn't think it was, but I still remember being in the library, at Eastern Washington and Googling, is it okay to transfer schools? And then I find out that hundreds of thousands of people transfer every term. I'm like, Oh, apparently it's totally acceptable. <laughs> yeah. It's really normal. I don't think people understand that. And you, you know, your path was your path. And it sounds like, I mean, you discovered a lot and yourself, which is, which is really exciting and wonderful. Um, so I want to respect your time. Gosh, you're also, you're, you're so wonderful. This has been like amazing. And I have a couple more questions and I might, I might just go like a couple over, but I'm not going to go much over that just because um, I really do want to respect that time. But I want to know all of you were part of the gear up program. I know Alondra, we touched on it a little bit, but I want to make it really clean and just, I'd like to just kind of do like a round table. Cause I know you're all here cause Noemi and some of the other counselors felt like you were just wonderful people who could really help others. So, you know, your names came out and there are lots of people. And, you know, so hopefully you can feel good about that. But in terms of, of how Gear Up helped you, Alondra, can you tell me just, and we'll go real fast because I want to get to two more questions and they're going to be very fast ones, but just tell me how, how Gear Up helped you. And you could even mention the name of, of someone who did and how they helped you. So Alondra, how did Gear Up help you? Gear Up helped me from the get-go of just thinking about college from the start, you know? Caesar and before that Caesar, there was another Caesar Hernandez. He, you know, constantly, I, we had events that we would go. So just having those three, Caesar Hernandez, Caesar Hernandez, and Noemi, just constantly push us to think about life after high school and having them host events for us, taking us to other colleges. I think we even got gone to a couple of job fairs. Being able to be exposed to that definitely helped me to be where I am now. Is there a specific activity or event or something they hosted that you remember really helped you? I remember with our first Cesar Hernandez, um, he took us to this job fair and there was a bunch of different universities everywhere. And I was just kind of like a kind of astonished, you know, like how big it was and how like how many opportunities there was. It was more eye opening. So I was actually, you know, starting to think about my major, what I wanted to do with my life. 
So yeah, I feel like that was one of the biggest events. Being able to be in that job fair and see how big it is. A bunch of other students at the same building too, taking information, all of this. It was really amazing. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Uh, Brianna, I would love to hear how Gear Up helped you. You're muted as well, Brianna. And so Brianna, tell me, how did Gear Up help you? I think that for me, I just wasn't a driven student. Caesar and Noemi, they really um, were on my butt about it and like really pushed me to apply and, you know, get on the right track. I want to ask you one more thing. And I loved having your daughter there, but I also wanted to get a clean, a clean take because you talked about beauty school and you talked about how it was a family and it was so wonderful. Can you just restate just, you know, just Evergreen Beauty College and just, you know, do you think that's a good place? Has it been a great experience for you? Yeah, um, I I 100% believe that that is probably one of the best schools that um, you can go to because a lot of schools, they kind of, um, they kind of just throw you out there and like let you do your own thing, you know, but um, man, they really, they teach you everything that you need to know. And um, we, so in order to become a cosmetologist, you have to um, get a state board certified. So um, you have to go through your um, practical and then written exam and you need to um, really know um, things that you wouldn't even think that you would need to know, like um, the anatomy of a body and um, just, man, there's a lot, there's a lot that you need to know, but um, they really go in depth about all of that. And um, it is a lot, but, um, a little bit scary at first because it's like, you know, you think of um, beauty school you think, Oh, like, we're just going to like, you know, play with hair all day. Like it's a lot more than just playing with hair. Like there is, um, a whole bunch of chemistry behind, um, doing hair and like, it's, it's seriously, it's a, it's a lot of fun. Um, the people to just like, to like, just get to like learn. And like, we yeah. are hands on, like we are working with, um, actual clients. Like we are able to take in clients, um, while we're in beauty school and, um, and like how just, are the people that you work with and the, and the, the teachers you mentioned they were, they were pretty great. Yeah. Um, so we, we, um, prepared by, um, going through the actual, um, state board, um, test, there's like, um, a routine that they follow. And so, um, they really, um, in depth teach you like the routine and, um, all the like sanitation, which is, um, the number one thing that, um, they look for is uh, the sanitation. Yeah. That's great. And you said it's like a family. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody is really close. Um, they're seriously, um, so helpful. Like even outside of school, um, you know, people would like meet up and, um, it, yeah, I have made some lifelong friends. Um, even like the teachers, I still talk to them today because it's it's like a job essentially. Like going to beauty school, it's like your is it's like a job. You like clock in and out every day um, for your hours, and um, they're just they really really push you to um, stay on track. Yeah. That's great to know. I don't think a lot of people understand it. So if they have more mm -hmm. questions, they can reach out to you for sure. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Brianna. How did Gear Up help you, Christopher? Taking part in this for, you know, current students, that was a part that helped me with, you know, the students coming back and speaking in the school and then the field trips too, because, you know, Central wasn't something I would have even thought about without the field trips. I didn't think there was much more to life outside of my community that I'm still technically a part of, but being a part of the Ellensburg campus and a student there, it's definitely opened my eyes to what the world has to offer in yeah. terms of education. So probably those two things. That's great. 
And then Cage, how did Gear Up help you? The number one thing for Gear Up for me personally was the relationships that I built. I remember going in the seventh grade and Cesar Hernandez, who was the Gear Up coordinator at the time, I never met the guy. And I built a really strong relationship with him. And I mean, to this day, I still talk to him pretty frequently. And, and then Noemi Barbosa, who came in later on, I don't talk to her as frequently as I do Caesar. But whenever I need some sort of advice around school, I usually reach out to her. I spoke with them so much and they gave me advice and guidance. And so what I would say, it was the relationships that I built. That was without a doubt the biggest thing that Gear Up gave to me. Is that is Cesar Hernandez? Where is he now? The one that you worked with? Is he at another so, school? The orig- so there was two Cesar Hernandez's. The first, the original Cesar, who is the one that I speak with frequently, he works in a different district now. I believe doing the same thing. Yeah, Cesar. So but I think it's a Toppenish. That's correct. Yeah, that's the Cesar. Oh, that's great. Um, I'm, I'm working on yeah. another project with Cesar, and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send him a note that we talked to you because. Yeah. You know, that's great. I love that he's still there. Like that's that's so cool that you that you're still in contact with Caesar and they're still in your corner. Like you're up still there for you. Like, right. All, all these years later, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, we're four years out of school and I still speak to my year coordinators. Oh my God. I <laughs> so. just I don't know if I can say that again because it like it was the most choppy thing. And again, it was like the best thing, Cage. So four years out of high school, and I still speak with my gear coordinators. And it's not because they're forcing me to speak to them, but I go out of my way to, hey, I need advice or a recommendation on something. It really shows you how how important gear up actually was in my schooling. That's awesome. That's so great. All right. I have my last question. This is a speed round one total. Then we're done. All right. And you guys are great. Has, I know. Thank you. I'll go really fast. So if you could all go back in time, and Alondra, you can unmute yourself. So if you could all go back in time and give yourself a tip. So Alondra, you see yourself, you see freshman Alondra walking through the halls at White Swan High School, and you get to walk up to Alondra and be like, hey, Alondra, it's me, Alondra, right? It's future Alondra. Alondra, if you can go back in time and give high school you, first year high school you a tip, what would you tell you? Oh, wow. That's a big one. But I feel like if I could go back and tell myself something is um, that it's going to be okay. That, you know, the decisions that I make and everything, uh, it's going to be okay. So don't get too stressed. Don't get too overwhelmed. Um, at the end of the day, like, as long as they're not life-threatening decisions, I feel like I'm going to be okay. So I feel like I would have saved myself some extra stress and uh, heartaches if I could have just gone with the flow and just let things be as it is and be confident, you know, accept accept failure. Uh, Definitely. I was not good with failure, but realize that it's going to be okay and accept failure. So it's a big one, but I feel like those are the main ones for me. And then one very quick piece of advice to other DACA students to help reassure them. That you're not alone. You're not alone. And it's a very uh, scary topic to talk about because uh, you could say something like that and uh, someone else might have a different position about, about it and where they stand with DACA, but you're not alone. Um, school I mean I could at least speak about heritage they never left uh my side when it came to uh renewing my uh, doc application they paid for the fee um if I any if I needed any legal counseling um they had lawyers attorneys there in school you just have to ask and a lot of students are a lot of times afraid and embarrassed to talk about their status but um there's, there's so many of us here now, you know, and we're standing up and, you know, you're not alone and we're stronger together. So uh, don't feel intimidated just because of our status, you know? So I could definitely just uh, 
from experience uh, speak up and know that there is help. Thank you. That's awesome. And it's so helpful for people to know and to hear and to be reminded of. So thanks, Alondra. Brianna, if you could go back in time, Brianna, and you can give you, freshman you, a tip, what would you, Brianna, tell you? Just live in the moment and just be a kid. Don't stress about, you know, things that don't need to be stressed about. Um, I think that I am someone who... I like everything to be planned out and, um, you know, life is going to throw you curveballs. So, um, I just think that just to live in the moment and live day by day and know that it's going to be okay. I know I'm not you yeah. offering a bunch uh-huh. of people, yeah, but like, definitely. Right. Uh-huh. Cause but, you're, yeah. you're doing it. Yeah. It will be okay. Yeah. I love it. Thanks Brianna. Cage, so I want to hear from you. So Cage, if you can go back in high school and you could talk to freshman high school Cage, what would you tell you? If I happen to cross paths with my freshman self, <laughs> um, I would just be like, hey man, self-acceptance. Don't be afraid of what others think of you or how you think others interpret you. Just be yourself and do your best and as long as you try your hardest, especially with the support system that we had, you're going to be just fine. So just trying to really pound that into freshman Cage's head. And if he really needs help, be like, hey, there's some really good books that I could recommend to you. So <laughs> That's awesome. You know, you should send me some of the books. I'll include them with this conversation if you have more of them, because it's fun for people to see those. And, you know, I'm a big fan of audio books. I have a hard time reading. Yeah, I, I love audiobooks as well. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I mean, because it's weird because I'm an author and you know I'm a New York Times bestselling author who has a hard time reading, which I felt a lot of shame about. Um, <laughs> but I've recognized that listening to books is is the same as reading them. So who cares? Even there's been some podcasts that I've listened to that have really really helped me out and just kind of opened my eyes to things that I can definitely recommend. And give me two. So. <laughs> this is more of a comedy podcast, but this specific specific episode, which was with Dr. Gio Valiente, it's called 51 Strokes. That's the name of the podcast. It's a golf podcast. Right. But the episode with episode with Dr. Gio Valiente, that was without a doubt the best podcast I think I've ever listened to in my life. And you said two, but that's the one I'm going to recommend because that was life changing. And I don't care. If you've never swung a golf club in your life, that listening to that will change your life. Just skip to the first or skip after the first five minutes because it's pure advertisements. But once you actually get to the actual interview, it's good. All right. I'm going to do this tomorrow. I'm in. Yeah, please do. I'm in. You've you've made it sound so great. And I love it. I want to know. This is is gold. So thanks, Cage. Uh, Christopher, uh, you're going to have the last word here. So I want to know, Christopher, if you could go back in time and give freshman, high school freshman, Christopher, a little bit of advice, uh, what would you tell you? Don't be afraid to take a step back when you need to or reach out for help and probably to take more risks. I felt like I didn't take enough risks because I had my comfort bubble that I like staying in. And I feel like that would be a big one to take risks when you can. Yeah. Hey, did you ever, I said one, one last question for you. Did you ever participate in therapy? Is that something that you ever explored? Did, did you get not something that? directly? I just, you know, spoke to people on campus when I could, or when they were available, it wasn't something I pursued directly, yeah. just, you know. Yeah. I was just curious because you, you've come so far and, you know, talking to people is so scary and I just think that you're, uh, you know, you're you're just wonderful in, in what you're doing and how you're working to support other people. I mean, you're you're all terrific. You're all fantastic. And I have a therapist who I see and on a regular basis because it really helps to talk to someone. And I think it's very scary. And I think that one of the messages that we can take away from from this conversation is the importance of talking to people. I mean, Brianna, and you know, thank you for sharing, and Christopher and Cage and Alondra. I mean, all of you talking to someone and knowing that when you do share that thing that causes you discomfort and really scares you, there's going to be someone who says, you know, I'm there for you. 
I'm there for you. And I know this panel, if anybody has any questions about what we've discussed or wants to reach out to you, you can just kind of give a nod. Are you comfortable with people reaching out to you? Are you comfortable answering questions? You know, are you going to think they're weird or, or are you going to be like, you're going to be open, right? You're happy to help. So I want, I want everybody to know that we have, we have a group of people who are really happy to help you and, and to be in your corner. Before I sign off, I just want to give everyone a chance. Is there anything you wanted to clear up or anything that you shared where you're like, you know, I just wanted to make sure that someone knew this or that. Are we all good? Because sometimes when we end this, someone's like, oh, I wish I said that or I wish I would clarified that. Is there anything else anyone wanted to add? No? Okay, terrific. I want to thank everyone for being here. Thank you, panelists. This has been incredible. Uh, thank you, Gear Up. Thank you to White Swan High School for partnering on our college conversation. I'm Harlan Cohn, and I look forward to continuing to be in your corner. Thanks, everyone.